Hello, I'm Tom Zuber. I'm the managing partner of Zuber Lawler, and I'm on the editorial board of Dead Cat Live Cat, an online quantum computing magazine. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Sasha Krujicic, uh, and he is with One Qubit, uh, and we're here to discuss uh, One Qubit's vision uh, in the quantum computing industry and how they're bringing quantum computing technology to solve real world practical problems. So, Sasha, welcome. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, thanks so much. Appreciate being here. So, Sasha, first, uh, a bit about you. Uh, I'd love to know. Uh, how did you uh, come upon the quantum computing industry? How did you find yourself immersed in it? Well, I, I came across the founders way back in 2010. Uh, we were classmates at a kind of postgrad-ish program down at NASA Ames called Singularity University. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, since that time, the, the founders had started One Qubit in 2012 uh, off the back of an investment in D-Way, which is a quantum annealing um, hardware manufacturer. And part of their investment uh, was uh, you know, well part of the nature of their investment was the desire in which to play around with the machines. Uh, so once they started to realize that those machines didn't necessarily have software, they thought, gee, it wouldn't be a good idea to be a software company in this emerging uh, industry. Uh, we kept in touch over the years, and about two and a half years ago, I joined the organization, albeit um, from a different vantage point than most. Uh, I don't have a degree in physics or mathematics uh, or computer science. So um, it, it, as you're speaking, it reminds me uh, a little bit, and, and I hope you don't mind the comparison to Microsoft, right? When Microsoft, when the, quantum, when, when the traditional computers uh, were emerging on the scene there, Microsoft uh, made a play and they said, we're going to focus on the software and not on the hardware. We're going to let IBM do that. And of course, Microsoft reaped the benefits of that. IBM became obviously IBM, a great company in its own right. But Microsoft obviously reaped the benefits of, of focusing on the software. Do you talk about that? You, you, I mean, I'd, I'd love to think that we were we're on track to become one of the world's largest companies, um, you know. But I think that the whole space is is very very early in its development, and I think yeah. the the nature of our position as an organization that is primarily a software company is that we get to see the different uh, hardware types kind of emerge through the different technical milestones that they achieve, and work with a lot of those organizations in which to achieve them. So we get this really wonderful vantage points and experience base being one of the earliest companies in this field um, to be able to share that perspective, not only with, you know, people who are interested in doing experimental quantum computing uh, in the kind of fault tolerant gate model sense, um, but then also work with some of the hardware manufacturers to kind of glean some insight from our experience of eight plus years in the industry. So, you know, we've seen a lot, we've done a lot, and uh, you know, it's, it helps us uh, assess the landscape, the maturity of it, um, what types of adoption we may want to encourage, uh, and then also try to help to accelerate the development both on the hardware and software side of things. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, and so let's talk about the software a bit. Uh, for the audience's sake, can you describe in layman's terms, what, what does one qubit software do? Yeah, so it's not a singular, uh, piece of software that we've necessarily developed. We're engaged in a couple of different uh, focused efforts. So uh, the first thing, just as a couple of points of distinction, one is uh, we really work on advanced and quantum computing uh, hardware and software solutions. So we're not, um, even though we do a lot of work in quantum computing development, we also look at kind of um, the leading edge of classic classical based um, computation and ways in which that we can leverage them and apply those to high value problems that may seem intractable or unsolvable um, with the traditional kind of high performance computing capabilities that exist out there. And then we also work on the, um, you know, on the integration of quantum computers into those workloads. So the way in which that we see the future is very much through this kind of hybridized co-compute lens, which is how do quantum computers and classical computers coexist and work in combination with one another to kind of solve some of these bigger problems. So when it comes to the high value uh, areas that, that we're most interested in and have invested in both software development, but also solutions-based development in, is in uh, chemistry. Uh, the optimization in machine learning and in AI. And I think those all exist on a bit of a kind of a time horizon, um, the nearest term being the chemistry piece, um, the kind of next kind of maybe major milestone or category of 
of, of capability that we hope that um, quantum computers will ultimately help us solve and tackle uh, around optimization and then eventually in terms of artificial intelligence and machine intelligence more broadly. But those things are always run through the lens of both advanced classical solutions working alongside quantum computers. So those things are, that's kind of our philosophy of it. And um, having, I guess, been, been around the block for a little while, we get to derive a lot of uh, a lot of experience and target what we think to be the most valuable use of this type of computation uh, moving forward. Uh, that, that was very helpful. Thank you, Sasha. And Sasha, one of the exciting things for me about the quantum computing industry is just, well, you're sort of watching this toddler grow up, right? And you sort of don't know uh, what clothes it's going to wear as a grown up and, and how it's going to walk and talk and all of that. You just get sort of uh, notions of that um, in, in that toddler stage, right? And I think the quantum computing industry is like that. And there are so many things um, that are happening in parallel in order to, to bring quantum computing, um, I think ultimately to the masses, right? And, and um, I, I don't know if you share that, that notion, but, but uh, I, I, know, I know many of us do, that ultimately quantum computers are gonna affect our lives just like uh, the traditional computer affected our lives going back obviously decades ago. So on that note, one of the biggest obstacles to getting to that point, to the industry getting to that point, um, is finding ways to take this, this spooky quantum technology as it is uh, and to apply that to real world problems, right? And your software does that. So it seems to me um, that that being one of the biggest obstacles uh, toward mass commercialization of quantum computers, um, that you have a particular vantage point which lets you speak to that. So uh, in, in a nutshell, I'd love to get into some of the details of how you're doing that, how you're taking this spooky quantum technology and applying that to real world problems. And I'd love to start, uh, if, if we could, in, in the chemical space, right? Can you, can you yep. give us an example of something you're doing there to solve a real world problem? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, to level set, I think we're, you know, we're really in the early stages of this kind of this whole paradigm of computation. So it's not, you know, we're not in a production ready state where we can be deploying solutions, you know, that have the kind of 99.9% .9 uptime and scale and replicability in terms of deployments that kind of we require in industry or in government to be able to kind of perform some of the tasks that we ultimately take for granted with the kind of computational resources that we have on our desks or in our server rooms um, around the world doing a, a lot of these uh, you know high value high value um, work and the way to think about quantum computers today is that they're largely experimental and the kind of the requirements to build these devices and control these uh, facets of nature and matter at the lowest levels where they, you know, the, the way in which things interact within the computer, um, a quantum computer specifically, aren't, uh, you know, they're not as, uh, it's not as obvious or it's not as intuitive to the way in which that we see the world at our kind of macroscopic scale. So yeah. part of the reason why chemistry and chemistry simulation is so interesting is that because when you get down to the lowest kind of levels of nature and you're trying to create new compounds or new pharmaceuticals, they all um, kind of are subjected to the same quantum mechanical effects that our devices are. So the reason why we think it's really interesting to invest behind that is that when you're dealing with all the kind of the spooky effects, as you call it, in chemistry, and you're trying to model those spooky effects into a digital computer or a classical computer, the size and complexity of trying to model all those spooky effects becomes immediately too immense for you to be able to compute in a simulation. Right. So as a result of that, when you try to simulate chemistry, you have to deal with trade-offs. So the trade-offs being around precision, and speed and scale and cost, right? So you have all of these different factors in the classical computational paradigm when it comes to chemistry that you have trade-offs in. When you get into the quantum aspects of it, you know, now you have less of a trade-off because you know, your, your, your problem and the way it exists and defines is exact, not exactly, but is very similar to the way in which that the actual devices are operating. So you can have, uh, you can map your problem more directly. And as these devices, as these devices scale in terms of qubit counts and, and reduction of processing time, you can simulate these 
kind of these uh, molecules in a computer that you could never do that before. So the software solutions that we're solution that we're focused on here is actually a hybridized solu um, solution that takes advantage of cloud computing resources as well as the integration of experimental quantum devices in solving these these molecular simulations. And I think that if you did a quick survey of the quantum computing industry currently, you would likely hear most people call out um, chemistry and molecular simulation as being the most kind of the shortest or the nearest term opportunity uh, for us to unlock value with quantum devices. Well, fascinating stuff here, right? And, and one of the things that is difficult to grasp is, is the notion of software interacting with these quantum particles that are taking the place of, of traditional bits in a computer, right? And, and you're dealing with things that are so small, operating in such cold temperatures, and, and how does that interface really happen there? And, and that's difficult, I think, for most folks to get their mind around, including me, right? And, and so that I find that, that to be fascinating. How about in the area of optimization AI? Um, it, it, there, there's obviously a lot of overlap between AI and quantum computing, and, and one is going to feed the other, I think, uh, we, but many think, in, in profound ways. So what are, or can you give us an example of a practical problem that you're solving uh, in, in that area, optimization AI? Yeah, so in the, in the world of optimization, I think we're still, again, in the experimental phases of what you can ultimately deploy on quantum computers. So. Um, the, you know, we can look at, and, and let me just draw a slight distinction here because I think it's, it's important. And, you know, when we talk about qubit counts and when I'm referencing quantum computers, I'm really talking about fault tolerant devices or even these NISC based devices, these, um, these noisy intermediate scale quantum devices oh. um, where the qubit counts are in the like double digits. And, you know, those, um, the, 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 the fact that we're still at that small level and uh, of qubit counts kind of restricts our ability to run any sophisticated optimization kind of um, optimizations on those device types. That being said, you know, there are that we've done some experimentation in the financial sector with a client of ours to do things like strategic asset allocation. So targeting, um, you know, uh, in that instance, we used, we worked with IonQ uh, to target their device and start to do kind of what would, a, what would an asset allocation optimization exercise look like on that device. Now it's, it's very small scale and you can only factor in so many variables, but I think what's incredibly important, and I think this is important for the industry more broadly is that when we think about formulating our problems to target these devices, as you described, it's not really intuitive that you know you have to kind of program the actual computer, or you have to formulate your problem in a way that takes that integrates things like um, you know the, your your uh, the almost like the network facets of the way in which that you build your qubit gates uh, and and take advantage of the the kind of the, the scale up from a memory perspective. So why it's important for industries to start to kind of lean forward into this into this into this industry um, in terms of quantum computing is that the, the, the problem formulation piece is counterintuitive, just like quantum mechanics is counterintuitive. So when we're testing things like how do you optimize a portfolio, you know, you have to think about these things slightly differently. And it's important to build up those capacities within industry so that as these devices scale and you start to take advantage of um, the, the massive, um, you know, speed ups and scale ups of these devices, you know, you, you're, you're at the ready and, and it can offer you a, a tremendous competitive advantage because that scale up and that speed up um, in terms of your ability to simulate a bunch of different combinations uh, can offer you, um, you know, a point of advantage. And, and that's why you see so many banks interested in the, in the space. Um, but one other small point of distinction is that, you know, not everything has to be cooled to, you know, zero Kelvin in which to be controlled. We do have, um, you know, devices and device approaches which are more stable at room temperature. So we don't have to do everything in the kind of um, in the superconducting realm of, of quantum computing development. There's trapped ions, there's photonics, um, cold atoms, different approaches. Uh, very helpful. Thank you, Sasha. And, and on that note, with, with the innovation that's obviously happening there, uh, forgive me, I'm an IP attorney, so I'm going to ask an IP uh, uh, legal question. Uh, yeah. I can't resist. So uh, on that note, uh, one of the things in the United States um, that's, that makes things difficult for software companies per se, uh, that it's difficult to get 
patent protection, traditional patent protection for software related interventions, right? And, and I'm sure you're, you're, you're at least somewhat familiar with that. So on that note, given that you're a software company per se, uh, but you're doing all of this interaction uh, with things that are more physical, uh, including the quantum computers themselves, um, how, how much are you investing, uh, when I say you, I mean one qubit, investing in protecting the innovation that's clearly happening there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to, I think what's interesting, and we have these discussions, you know, quite a lot, and, and don't worry about being an attorney talking about quantum computers, I'm an advertising guy talking about quantum computers, so we're probably confusing everybody at this stage, um, but um, that, 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 that's fine, we'll, we'll fix it in, in post, as we say, um, the, uh, the from, an, from an IP perspective, I think that you know, as you start to develop these kind of novel approaches or innovations around the applications of the of these devices, you know, it begs a lot of questions as to what the future value is going to be. And oftentimes, you're taking, uh, you know, educated guesses as to whether or not what you've developed is going to be the thing, or it's going to be another one of those things that is not as relevant as um, as you had hoped. And when you think about the, the value of the industry, you know, in the end state, um, you know, you, you're likely going to be able to, and this is true of most industries, is that like the, the value will likely kind of gravitate towards the extremes, meaning the kind of the device and the software that's interacting with the device and then the outcomes in which that it's creating. So, you know, for us, when we think about our kind of core IP strategy, you know, we really look at it through that lens, which is, if the value on the front end of investing heavily in uh, in chemistry is the fact that you can reduce, you know, you no longer need labs, and you can start to simulate all your uh, all the molecules through your laptop, um, and that brings reduces the cost of research and development and material discovery and can generate all kinds of efficiencies and green materials that can you know radically kind of change the world you know, that's where that value lies. So um, it's really about trying to assess where you anticipate the value to lie. And I think that, you know, I mean, I think from my personal perspective, like owning IP in a rent seeking kind of capacity isn't contributing value to the industry um, more generally. So yeah, that's kind of the way we think about it. And I think about it. Oh, very good. Uh, and um, on, on that note of innovation, I, I it, we say, okay, we're going to make software that's going to interact with these quantum computers to solve practical problems. And that sort of sounds straightforward enough, but there, there are obviously a uh, 100, 1,000, a 1, million problems that need to be solved between here and there. Um, so uh, on that note, is there one particular uh, challenge, technical challenge that, that one qubit had to overcome since the time you've been there that, that you'd like to talk about? Because I'd personally be very interested just in hearing an example of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, you know, it's never just the one thing, right? And I think that if, if I were to, you know, the chemistry folks would be like, hey, no, the stuff that we're doing in chemistry is the one big technical hurdle, like the, the fact that you can, um, you know, you can, in, you can use quantum computers and, and, and classical computers side by side in a particular software solution is, you know, we solve that big technical challenge, which is a big technical challenge. Uh, the hardware team would talk about you know all the error correction and noise mitigation strategies and the products associated with how to architect your hardware is the you know the the most appropriate technical challenge and then our healthcare team would be like we've actually deployed an ai solution in radiology and we're actually saving lives so like you know so i think that there's I, it's hard to just you know distill it into one because i think our organization in spite of being like 140 people actually have small teams that are dedicated towards overcoming some of these technical barriers of adoption. Um, you know, that all being said, I mean, even the stuff we're working with our end customers on in terms of how to formulate their problems in a way that targets these advanced and quantum um, computing solutions um, is, is no small feat. Like it's not, it's not a trivial thing transferring, you know, the, all the challenges you have in railroad scheduling from the people, the trains, the tracks, the locations, the timing, the cargo, the how you pack the cargo, like formulating an optimization based solution in which to generate, you know, upwards of 30% of efficiencies, you know, in an application by using computers is a huge feat. So, I mean, you know, it's like trying to pick between your kids and they're not even my kids. They're just kids that I get to play with in the playground at one qubit. 
Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Um, but let's talk about the quantum industry uh, in general. Uh, what, how will quantum computing affect practical everyday human life within the next five, 10 years in your view? I mean, I, I think, don't think you're gonna see it. I think that's probably the best way to answer that question is that it's gonna be the, it's going to be the things that operate or unlock, uh, you know, some of the kind of novel innovations in the world that you ultimately appreciate, but will probably be the unsung hero in the background. So um, if you're looking at things like desalinization of water and there's a particular, uh, you know, approach or technology that's been developed off the back of, of you know, quantum computation in terms of like what are, what's, what, you know, what's required in which to desalinate water, desalinize water so you can have you know, clean potable water from the ocean. Um, then you know, there may be instances where you see the applications of quantum computers in that capacity, or if you see you know, uh, generating you know, large scale um, efficiencies in the way in which that um, emergency services tap into disaster response, right? Your ability to do these high powered simulations or combinatorial optimizations in particular uh, facets of, 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 of the world, um, you know, through simulation, I think is where you're gonna see the impacts, but you're not gonna turn around and say like, you know, as a regular person on the street, like, thank God for quantum computing, because now we've had reduced, you know, the, uh, you know, the duration of getting um, emergency relief into this kind of part of the Americas that has just dealt with an earthquake. You're going to probably thank the fact that we were able to, you know, all the people and the resources in which to get there. So I think it's going to be more of a, an unsung hero in the background of a lot of these things, um, especially in the kind of five-year time horizon. I think when you get to like the 10 plus year horizon, I mean, it becomes total speculation. And I know you're a sci-fi uh, guy. So, I mean, I think the way to, you know, what, what our hope is, is just, you know, advancing machine intelligence, you know, through the kind of leveraging of these types of resources to kind of improve the way in which that we all interact with society and, and technologies moving forward. Do you think that quantum computers will ever, ever, whether it's five years, 10 years, be mass commercialized, so to speak? I think uh, maybe, I guess is the answer. I think most of the, one of the questions that, that's a prevailing question is um, in the industry and even outside the industry is what is this stuff good for? And I think we have a sense of what the ultimate applications will be um, for quantum devices as they you know, achieve that fault tolerant at scale, 99% um, uptime type of milestones in terms of, of that development. But the nature of the devices as we understand them today are still very new to us. And much like quantum mechanics is counterintuitive, trying to understand what quantum computers can ultimately do in the world is also counterintuitive because you have to kind of deprogram the way in which that you look at things through this very deterministic lens and start to think about things through a probabilistic lens, which begs all kinds of questions. So I think that there may be some kind of chance that every one of us will have a quantum computer in our kind of on our desktop or in our laptop. Um, I just, you know, what, what we would use those for, I think is part of the exciting reason why you'd want to get into this industry is, you know, how do you start to leverage these uh, emerging capabilities to do things differently than have been done before? You know, it, it's fun to think about Moore's law in this context, right? Because it's tempting to dismiss Moore's law and can that really go on forever? Um, and at the same time, here we are, and, and it seems perhaps it can. And every time you think you're going to hit a wall, then there's a new innovation. Nanotechnology should obviously take us to another exponential curve uh, and so on and so forth. So then you wonder, is, is Moore's law going to continue to apply to quantum computers? So you compare the, the cell phone that we have today uh, to the uh, computer that took the man to the moon and took up a whole room and it's a million times more powerful and you extrapolate forward and and if you do the same thing in quantum computers are we going to have something sitting on our desk like an apple IIe that does what quantum computers do and obviously you've got all kinds of issues uh, I, I heard your note about not having to be at, at, at four kelvin and, and so forth in all circumstances but still there are there are those hurdles and, and it's just wonder how how long is is moore's law going to hold true um 
yeah. I mean, my pers- I mean, my perspective on that is that the the levels. Of, so first and foremost, like I mean, we keep bumping up against it, and I think yeah. that the interest in computation as kind of a general, um, you know, facet of our society and economy is going to continue to gain interest and gain traction. I mean, you look at the machine learning and deep learning field as it exists today. It's you know maybe. 10 or 100 folds, you know, more advanced than it was even a couple of years ago. And even there where we see these beautiful, um, you know, beautiful outcomes of simu- you know, of computers that are beating humans in particular, you know, games, or we're seeing the advancements of robotics in controlling things at that kind of a human-like level, you know, the computational cost required to do some of those things are so immense that it becomes, you know, you start to bump up against what you can actually do that's meaningful and novel um, and impactful. But in accordance with that is the levels of investment and interest that you're getting from, you know, governments and universities and people to get involved into things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. And those things are interrelated with quantum computing in many facets. And I think that if we think about it from a more broad perspective as to what drives the acceleration or the doubling of computational capability with Moore's law, a lot of it has to do with the commercial realities or the, the you know, the um, the investment realities that are associated with it. So I think that, you know, collectively the world believes in computation and is investing accordingly. So I don't imagine it's going to slow down anytime soon because the stakes are so high. Yeah, I agree with that. So uh, let's say that you had ten thousand dollars to invest um, in a, a Canadian, in a in a in a one hundred percent quantum focused company, um, not uh, not one qubit, and we're not talking about larger companies that have quantum computing divisions, but talking about bona fide, uh, pure thoroughbred quantum computing companies. Um, would you? And you may not want to answer, but I, I'd really push you to try and answer. Besides one qubit, what company would you invest in, and why? I mean, one, that's a terribly unfair question. Um, part of the reason why we're agnostic and try to work with everybody um, is, is uh, you know, precludes me from, from taking investment positions uh, <laughs> in the ones in which that we, um, that we like the best. I mean, look, there's, a, I mean, there's an emerging ecosystem, I think, in Canada. Um, yes. Xanadu is probably one of the, it's been around for a couple of years and it's, and it's focused on um, you know, a particular approach with regards to quantum computing development. Um, D-Wave is, you know, we were, you know, founded kind of by an investment in D-Wave. So there's, you know, they're a bit more established and a bit more at scale. So I don't know if my $10,000 would be as useful to them as it might be to a company like Xanadu. (laughs) By the way, Xanadu also raised a bunch of money. Um, But I think what's really exciting, and I think that's um, to slightly take this kind of question in a different direction, is that, you know, we're deeply involved in things like um, the Creative Destruction Lab, Um, So CDL has a whole quantum program, which we're involved with, and we, you know, a lot of our team members who are far more technically proficient, um, you know, spend time with people in CDL to help conceive of of their kind of strategies and and new solutions and new products that they want to, you know, bring to market in the quantum computing realm. So I think that, you know, we're cheerleaders for the whole ecosystem and I don't think that if we took that ten thousand dollars and divided it up uh, by ten thousand, gave everybody a buck, we'd make much uh, impact. But um, let's just say if there was a, an ETF that was, you know, the quantum computing in Canada ETF, we put ten thousand dollars in that. Very good, uh, and and that was a fair answer to an unfair question. Uh, so let's talk about ethical concerns for a bit, because obviously they're here. Um, quantum computing is potentially are so powerful. Um, what does that do to privacy and and uh, and online security and so forth? So how how concerned should we be um, about those issues, privacy, security issues, in the context of the of the future power of quantum computers? I mean, ethics I think are important in in every aspect of society and the development of technologies, especially ones that are super. Um, that have a potential impact that the ones that we are talking about um, could potentially have. And I think that from a security perspective, there's many uh, organizations that have very specific targeted uh, solutions for this kind of inevitability of RSA encryption, you know, falling prey to quantum computers. Now, 
I think that, and the reason why that that is a, a future risk is that you know we use prime numbers. You know, we use pick two prime numbers, and it gives you a really long other number, and that gives you kind of like your shared code as you transmit data. You know, using RSA encryption across you know your device, so to your bank and so forth. Um, and the reason why quantum computers are you know a threat to that is because you can factor prime, you know, can, you can factor big numbers and determine what the kind of those two prime numbers are, which are frankly the kind of keys to unlock that encryption. Right. So I think that there's definitely a realistic uh, or potential threat there. I just think that the ability in which to step, you know, step around or step sideways um, against those threats, um, there's plenty of technologies and approaches I think you can employ that don't require you to do um, something as radical as rip out all your servers and fundamentally um, kind of transform your um, the nature and the way in which that you interact with with people. So uh, I think that you know from a security of data perspective, I think that there's there's plenty of room to innovate in those aspects that would render maybe some of the kind of requirements from a quantum computer um, that could eventually kind of deal with the decryption of that information. Um, I think there's plenty of strategies and ways in which and, and smart people that are working on that currently. So I think it's less of a threat than we maybe think it is. But again, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm also, you know, not a physicist or a mathematician. So don't take my word for it. Um, so and you may not be able to answer this question, Sasha. And, and so I'm going to ask another unfair question, though, sure. uh, which is, can you tell us about a practical problem that you're working on solving today, meaning one qubit is working on solving today? Because I'd love to hear about that, too, if you can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I can speak about it in general terms. I mean, yeah. I think that as it relates to quantum computing, obviously, we have the chemistry software uh, mm -hmm. that we're developing, uh, and that targets quantum devices and renders them very useful in, in, in simulating molecules and, and determining the ground state of those molecules. So I think that that's a real world practical application. Uh, we've also doing work in the hardware space. So we're working with hardware manufacturers to deal with some of the kind of noise that emerges from trying to control these, you know, this, these very low levels of matter and deal with things like error correction or even um, architectures of the way in which that you build your gates between different qubits. You know, all of those strategies and kind of requirements of building these devices are there and it requires, you know, a village in which to be able to try to solve for that. Um, because, you know, there's, there's different kind of technologies and strategies that emerge from different kind of corners of the world. And the team that the team and the work that we're doing in that space is targeting specifically kind of some of those quantum computing challenges. So it's like the real world and they're practical. They're just not in the like, you know, does it, does it make Fortnite run faster on my device? Probably not, and not in the anytime soon. So it's probably going to be a less of a kind of a sexy story to to, to tell your kids um, about you know the work you did on quantum computers today. Fair enough, but still pretty awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, the most important question uh, of this uh, exchange: uh, What's your favorite movie and why? Okay. <laughs> so you tried to you tried to pin me down and force me to give you a sci-fi example, and I immediately rejected the. That's the only question I rejected in the list. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, for me, it's it's Stand by Me. So, um, I, you know, being born in whatever seventy nine and being a bit of an eighties eighties and early nineties brat. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful movie. It's an yeah. incredible story. It's, you know, it's coming of age story of four boys. So it's got a whole bunch of resonance for me personally. Um, it's yeah. And it's just got so many life le lessons all kind of embedded into, into one beautiful narrative and the, you know, the voiceover is wonderful. The conclusion of it is wonderful. You have even have a computer at the end. Um, as he finishes the story, so it's not a handwritten book. So I, I just, it, to me, it's a very, it's a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful movie and a beautiful story. So um, it's always ranked at the top of my list. Uh, I agree with you there. Rob Roder did a great job on that movie. He directed it, um, and also it was River Phoenix's. I think it was one of his early movies, and he was a real talent. It's a shame we lost him as early yeah. as we did. So Sasha, uh, that was a, a wonderful uh, interview and, and entertaining and educational. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the work you're doing with One Qubit. Really. Yeah, my pleasure. And you know what? It just occurred to me. I'll tie it into sci-fi for you. 
Will Wheaton right. was on the Star Trek Next Generation. Will Wheaton was also in Stand By Me. So there you go. You got your sci-fi connection. I love it. I appreciate that very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thanks for your time. I appreciate the questions. Thanks so much, Sasha. Really appreciate it. Talk Cheers. soon.